Daniel Goleman argues that IQ isn't everything. Our current view of intelligence is too narrow, ignoring important abilities that determine how well we do in life. The superior metric that Goleman prefers to use to measure life success is EQ, otherwise known as emotional intelligence. It's made up of these five things. Number one, self-awareness. This is knowing one's emotions as they happen. If you can do this, you'll make better decisions. Number two, managing emotions. This is the ability to handle feelings. People that can manage their emotions are good at bouncing back from the setbacks in life. Number three, self-motivation. Number four, empathy. This is recognizing emotions in others. This is the people skill that makes people better at teaching, sales, and management. And last of all, handling relationships. These abilities lead to popularity, leadership, and interpersonal effectiveness. So how do we improve our emotional intelligence? Goleman offers various insights throughout the book. I'll go over the ones that I found the most useful and I think you will too. Lesson 1. The Ventilation Fallacy Venting when you're angry prolongs your mood rather than ending it. Goleman tells of a story where he's in New York and he hops in a cab. The impatient cab driver honks the horn, signalling a young man to move out the way. The young man flips a bird so the cab driver yells back, You son of a bitch! Followed by revving the engine loudly out of anger. As a cab takes off, the driver then says, You can't take shit from anyone. You gotta yell back. At least it makes you feel better. Contrary to popular belief, Goleman along with findings from multiple studies argues that venting your anger doesn't make you feel better, but instead prolongs and amplifies your anger. It pumps up the emotional brain's arousal and leaves people feeling more angry. Don't get confused though. Venting when you're sad can be a great way to get your feelings validated, but isn't as effective when you're angry. So when you feel yourself becoming angry, what can you do to control your anger? A. Take a few deep breaths to help you relax and slow your heart rate. This helps your body go from a high arousal to a low arousal state. B. Go for a walk, but don't indulge in anger-inducing thought. C. As bad thoughts come to you, write them down and then reframe them. For example, if your spouse gets upset at you and storms out the room, Instead of thinking, Oh, she's so cranky all the time for no reason. It drives me nuts. Write down that thought and reframe it to, Maybe she's just had a bad day at work. Lesson 2. Don't ruminate when you're sad. Distract yourself instead. A saleswoman gets depressed and spends so many hours worrying about it that she doesn't get around to important sales calls. Her sales then decline, making her feel like a failure, which feeds her depression. But if she reacted to depression by trying to distract herself, she might well plunge into the sales calls as a way to get her mind off the sadness. Sales would be less likely to decline, and the very experience of making a sale might boost her self-confidence, lessening the depression somewhat. What Goldman is trying to say here is that continuing to think negative thoughts will lead you deeper into sadness. Distractions are what break the chain of sadness maintaining thinking. The best distractions are ones that will shift your mood such as a funny movie, reading an uplifting book, or going to an exciting sport event. He says distractions are more effective than crying because crying often reinforces rumination and prolongs misery. Goldman offers four more solutions to managing sadness. Alright, here are some goodies. A. Aerobic exercise is good because it changes your physiological state. Depression is a low arousal state, and aerobic exercise counters it by putting you into a high arousal state. B. Go for that easy success. Do that small task that you've been putting off for a while and reap the rewards. C. Reframe the situation. Just like with anger, take note of bad thoughts when they come to you and see them in a more positive light. I can resonate with this strategy which helped me after my first relationship ended. I had a lot of negative thoughts like, life will never be the same without her. After seven months, I finally accepted that the relationship was over, and if I continued to grieve, I would surely get nowhere. So instead I thought, okay, that relationship wasn't so great. What can I learn from it? This was a massive turning point in my life. I'm now in a new relationship and things are going great. Something that never would have happened if I didn't change my thinking. Lastly, help others in need. It helps us empathize with others and lifts us out of negativity. Okay, next up, this is one I really like. Here we go, lesson three. The Artful Critique. How to Criticize the Right Way. 
Criticism is important in how it is given. It determines how satisfied people are with their work, with those whom they work with, and those who are responsible. One of the worst criticisms if you're managing people is to say, you're screwing up, delivered in a harsh, sarcastic, angry tone. It provides neither a chance to respond, nor any suggestion of how to do things better. It ignores a person's feelings and leaves them feeling helpless and angry. A much more effective way to criticize would be to say, the main difficulty at this stage is that your plan will take too long and so escalate costs. I'd like you to think more about your proposal, especially the design specifications for your software development, to see if you can figure out a way to do the same job more quickly. This gives them hope of doing better and suggests the beginning of a plan to do so. Goldman says you need four things to successfully deliver constructive criticism. They are, be specific, offer a solution, do it face to face, and be sensitive by showing empathy. Lesson four, emotional contagion. Set the emotional tone. So in a simple experiment, two volunteers filled out a checklist about their moods at the moment, and then sat facing each other quietly, waiting for the experimenter to return to the room. Two minutes later, she returned and asked them to fill out the mood checklist again. The pairs were purposely chosen so that one partner was highly expressive of emotion and one who appeared flat and expressionless. It turns out that the mood of the expressive person had been transferred to the expressionless person. This is an example of emotional contagion. Our emotions are contagious like a virus. They spread through others. This is why speakers like Tony Robbins are able to hype up their audience and get them involved. They show their passion and energy, which spreads through the audience like wildfire. Goldman says this ability to drive the emotional state in another person through emotional contagion is at the heart of influencing people, whether that's through speaking, teaching, singing, or in any other interpersonal communication.